The South Metro Fire Marshal knew that an apartment building was violating fire codes before the day that it burned, killing one person in Arapahoe County and injuring four others. People who lived in the complex told our Cole Sullivan they would complained to management about electrical hazards for months, worried something like this could happen. Outlets and possibly the wiring, and we are afraid it is a fire hazard that is putting us at risk. With one outlet in particular in our living room that gets very hot to the touch when in use. Marcus Broker worried this would happen. This was sent August 5th of 2022. That's why he wrote the fire marshal with concerns about electrical issues in his Ivy Crossings apartment building. One of the outlets sparked every time he plugged something in. I knew it was going to happen. I hoped it wouldn't. It happened early Saturday morning. A nearly identical building in the same complex off Quebec caught fire. South Metro says multiple people got trapped as it burned. Some jumped from balconies to escape. One didn't make it out. Investigators still don't know what caused the fire. I was not surprised. I, at this point, I was kind of waiting for something to happen. Broker's warning wasn't the first. The Ivy Crossing's tenant union says this video shows broken smoke detectors and missing fire extinguishers inside the building that burned. Documents show the fire marshal came in February and told management about broken fire doors and the lack of a manual alarm system, both violations of fire code. It, it felt unsafe just living there. Broker says management didn't fix his electrical problems, so he moved out. After the fire, he's especially grateful he left Ivy Crossings behind. It made me realize that my concerns were legitimate, as well as just my fear of living in there, and just disgust, absolute disgust. We tried multiple times today to get in touch with management at Ivy Crossings, but had no luck. The fire department says marshals, fire marshals finding violations is not that unusual, and they typically try to work with management to fix it before a fire actually happens, Kyle. Yeah, there are no doubt all kinds of properties around our community that have issues like that. You just hope that when somebody brings them to official attention that something gets done about it. And that's what they say was happening in this case. The fire marshal says they typically work pretty closely with management. It's unclear how much action was actually taken before this fire happened. Cole Sullivan, thank you. People in a small community in southern Colorado still can't go home tonight because of a wildfire. It started yesterday in Los Animas County, west of the town of Aguilar. Since then, it's destroyed two buildings and burned more than 100 acres with no containment. Another small fire is burning west of the U.S. Air Force Academy down in El Paso County. Firefighters say it's burned about 20 acres near the Rampart Reservoir. They initially told people south of Woodland Park to get ready to evacuate, but they, they called that off. Tonight, though, firefighters have hoses set up all the way around the fire and are cooling things down. The same area burned in the Waldo Canyon fire back in 2012. Fortunately, today's fire is nowhere near that intense. Danielle checking in. It's like we can't have, you know, the heat and the sunshine without some fire danger. Absolutely. And the heat returns tomorrow, Alex, along with those strong winds, low humidity values. So this is something that we're going to be looking at not just tomorrow, but also into Thursday too. The red flag warnings will go back into effect tomorrow starting at lunchtime. They'll continue until 8 o'clock. Much of the eastern side of the state stretching south further to the west, I should say, and then into southern Colorado tomorrow afternoon for wind gusts upwards of 45 miles per hour. Then looking ahead until Thursday, the Denver metro area, the I-76 corridor heading out across the northeastern plains will be under a fire weather watch. These strong southwesterly winds will be picking up throughout much of the day tomorrow, anywhere between 20, 30, 40 miles per hour and it's not just of course the eastern plains but also the high country will be pretty windy too. Not a ton going on HG Doppler 9 tonight. We have clear skies and this ridge of high pressure just continues to strengthen. It will shift off to the east, but we still have one more day in the 80s for us tomorrow. And once again, that could be a record breaker. The current forecast for tomorrow, 84. The current record, 79. It looks like we will smash that. But I do have some moisture coming our way in the extended forecast, a little rain, possibly some snow. I'll detail that and show you my seven day forecast in just a few. Hey, Danielle. Perth had passed was shut down for most of the day after an avalanche covered up all the lanes of US 40. The slide stopped traffic. People were just there waiting for CDOT to clear everything up. The Colorado Avalanche Information Center says avalanche danger is pretty high right now. Warmer temperatures can melt one layer of the snow and then bring down a bunch in a slide. The wet winter is going to give a temporary boost to states that rely on Colorado snowpack, but it's not enough to wipe away the West's worst drought in centuries. Today, the federal government shared a couple of ways that western states could pull off 
unprecedented cuts to water use along the Colorado River. For a year now, federal water managers have been telling Colorado and six other states that use the Colorado River water that they need to figure out how to use dramatically less of the water. The states could not agree on a plan, so now the feds are offering some options. Option one would be do nothing, which is not great if you need electricity from the Hoover Dam and, and the state of Colorado does. Option two, if Lake Mead falls low enough, make California, Arizona and Nevada use less water with the cuts based on the age of their water rights. Basically means that the states that call dibs first get cut the least. So California, which uses the most water but has the most senior water rights, would get priority. Option number three would be to make California, Arizona and Nevada share the cuts more evenly. Some of the commentary uh, has depicted an us versus them dynamic in the basin. I don't see that at all. I see commitment, collaboration, and problem solving. The federal government would really like the states involved to agree on one plan without getting the courts involved. Experts worry that if the states decide to sue in order to get their preferred plan, it could take decades to sort out, and the drought could only worsen in that time. The states and the native tribes that rely on the Colorado River get to weigh in on these plans through the end of May. Boulder Municipal Airport looks a little different from other local options. Doesn't have a control tower like Broomfield and Centennial, and most of its operations consist of recreational flying, gliders, and first responders. The city wants to explore some other ideas and is asking the community for feedback on its future. Our Luis de Leon takes a closer look. All right, good evening, everyone. A room filled with people. There's a lot of different um, perspectives and knowledgeable people in this room. Means a room that can be filled with ideas. And within those plans, it's suggested that we either improve the airport or possibly look at um, other potential uses for the airport site. Boulder Municipal Airport is due for an airport master plan, a process guided by the FAA. We're able to have this conversation. But separately, the city is hoping to hear from the community on what they want to see with the airport's future before taking proposals back to council. You don't see very many jets coming into and out of the Boulder Airport. John Kinney is the airport's manager. While he may not see many passenger jets here, he says he does see the airport's potential. So whether it's people learning to fly, people understanding the economic value of an airport and what it brings in terms in terms of tangible economic impacts to the community, uh, but at the same time, not having the activities dominate or degrade the community's quality of life to their homes. Folks Tuesday had all sorts of ideas to stick to the board. Still, the direction the city is moving with the site is not clear just yet. And some things we've heard thus far is, is looking at the future of aviation and how that could benefit the city of Boulder. The city's senior transportation planner, Allison Moore Farrell, says they've already heard feedback on mitigating noise, but are hoping to look at other options too. So we're looking at continuing safety at the airport and continuing our operations. Can we also introduce other land uses? Can we look at other ways to improve community relations at the airport? In Boulder, I'm Luis De Leon for Nine News. There will be two more open houses for community feedback. There's also an online questionnaire that will be up until early May. A couple says they had to close their market inside an RTD station because of meth contamination. The Chas run Ginny's Market inside the downtown Boulder station. RTD closed the bathrooms in a the hallway there back in January after finding high levels of methamphetamine contamination. Jiwa Cha says she paid her rent in January and bought thousands of dollars in inventory right before the closure. And unless they can get back in, she and her husband will have to close their shop. Nobody take responsibility. I lost everything. So I just talked to the city of Boulder, some the, uh, kind of a financing helping. They said no. I called the IPD. We didn't terminate the, our contract, just delayed. I already paid a month, a whole month January the rent. So <laughs> I don't know what can I do. RTD says that the Shahs don't have to pay rent month to month because they cannot operate their store at the moment. RTD estimated it will be another three months before the station opens again.